Welcome uh, to this event, which is sponsored by the Center for the Studies of Men and Masculinities, and uh, I think co-sponsored by the Sociology Department. Uh, maybe I'm making this up, is that true or not? No, we're in gender studies. Oh, that's right, and, and exactly, and, and WAX also. I don't know if anybody from, from that department is here, but uh, they co-sponsor it. Uh, it is a pleasure to introduce Rox at Smea, <laughs> who is currently an associate professor in the Department of Philology at University of Silesia in Katowice, Poland. His interests include Polish literature and culture of the 20th century on gender and queer studies, critical studies of men and masculinities. Currently, he's working on a book about medical discourses of masculinity in interwar Poland. He received his MA in 2001 on the basis of his thesis Homosexuality in Jaroslav Iwaszkiewicz <laughs> short stories, followed by his PhD on the basis of his work Polish Homosexual Literature after 1980. Since then, he has published three books in Polish literature which doesn't exist, Essays on Polish Homosexual Literature, Krakow 2010, Homosexuality and Modernity, Essays on History, Theory and Literature, Katowice 2015, and Hegemony and Trauma, Literature and Depictions of Masculinity, Warsaw, Warsaw 2017. And he also authored numerous articles. Um, he participated in a four-year project, Hegemony and Trauma, no, I'm sorry, um, Masculinities in Polish Culture and Literature in the 19th and 20th century, which resulted in three volume, a uh, three volume anthology of texts, Forms of Masculinity 1, 2, 3. He's lectured in gender studies at various universities in Europe and elsewhere, and he has also participated in many um, conferences, scientific conferences, and co organized the Biopolitics of Masculinity in 2018. Uh, he's also a freelance journalist and explores, I don't know why it says peripheral <laughs> regions of Central and Eastern Europe, Poland, Russia, Ukraine, the Balkans, and he does photojournalism, uh, and his reports and photo stories were published in leading Polish newspapers like the Gazeta Wyborcza, Opinion Magazines, Politica, and Specialized Press. And his book from 2012, Literally, Worst Worlds, Reports and Snapshots from Central and Eastern Europe is a collection of his works. And in today's presentation, Wojciech is going to talk about the vision of masculinity, which proliferates among Polish radical organizations, as for example, National Radical Camp. Those of you who follow European politics could have taken it in, I think it was last week, mm -hmm. and there was a march which was very controversial, and I think the lines itself is tied to the yeah, topic. The, of the large will be the main point of my presentation. Ah, okay, so there we go. Okay, thank, thank you, you very, very much, much for, for, for this outstanding presentation. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, uh, I'm really stressed, excuse me. Uh, my English is not very, not as good as I'd like it to be. So I prepared my the, the paper and I'll be reading. Excuse me for for for, for reading. Uh, uh, my main idea is to understand, to explain the political radicalism in in, in Polish contemporary politics, and uh, find uh, how important is the very particular vision of masculinity in this uh, radical uh, movement. So I, 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 start, I, I start my presentation. Uh, <clears throat> radical movements of the Polish far right consist, as elsewhere, mainly of young men. The strict gender binarism, the exaltation of men's power, homosociality, brotherhood, physical strength, and subordination of women. Their domestication and ascribed role of child bearer and housewife are omnipresent among angry white men everywhere, including Poland. But these general characteristics have always a local variance, trajectories, and particularities. 
in my paper, I'm going to try to explain this phenomenon on, in its local context. To do so, I'll analyze the map of independence, so the event you mentioned, you just mentioned. The march of independence are cyclical celebration of radical groups and the discourses of masculinity, femininity, ethnicity, which proliferate on this occasion. The first part of my paper, I focus on the social and economic background, worldview, and masculinist ideology of Polish angry white man. The second part will focus on historical and cultural coding of their aggrieved entitlement. By doing so, I provide you, I believe, with deeper and more multidimensional understanding of anti-liberal turn in Poland and its gender dimension. But let me begin with uh, an anecdote, which is, I believe, quite instructive, and as such, it can serve as a good introduction for my presentation. I'm a literary scholar, specializing in gender and queer studies. I have sometimes extra classes for uh, uh, the students of other departments, where I lecture on cultural norms of uh, gender and sexuality, changing ideas of men and masculinities, the historical positioning of women and femininity. Last year I was uh, lecturing for biology students, and my class's topic concentrated around uh, uh, historical formations of masculinity in Polish culture. At the percent of uh, the audience were young women, only around 20% were young, uh, young men. One of my first questions uh, for the group was, what a man is, how do we define masculinity? To be honest, I expected some biological answers, and so would you, I suppose. Some essentializing statements about biological differences, testosterone, sexual dimorphism, could be a good starting point for a passionate discussion. What I got instead shocked me profoundly. The discussion was dominated by a small but outspoken group of female students who claimed that the main feature of being a man is to be ready to fight and die for the fatherland. I remarked that when this criterion is applied, manhood of those who prefer living peacefully is at least vague and, uh, so to speak, conditional. When I turned to these few male students in my class, if they could comment on it, express their feelings and convictions they have about masculinity. Two or three of them denied such definition and claimed they do not define their own masculinity in such terms. The other five or six said nothing, and I didn't press them. What I've learned is that contemporary young men's masculinity and their lived experience is shaped to an unusual degree by ubiquitous historical or even mythological discourses of masculinity. And they are expected to declare their readiness to fight as a sign of their subordination to traditional male role and the gender order. Even though the majority of them distance from warlike nationalist manhood, they have to take into consideration that it is getting into power, becoming more and more legitimate and common form of manhood a natural and self-evident form of masculinity for many. Probably some of you have seen on TV or read in a newspaper recent reports about Polish Independence Day celebrated by the Polish Prime Minister and President hand in hand with motley crowds of nationalists and neo-fascists who dominated public places and the main streets of Polish capital and whose ideology imbricate more and more with official mainstream of Polish politics, culture, and social life. The organization which takes responsibility for this celebration is very effective in promulgation of a very specific radical form of masculinity, which is presented as the only appropriate, natural, self-evident, and distinctively Polish one. Obviously, these claims are neither true nor relevant, Nevertheless, they deserve deeper scrutiny, and we should ask why they are so successful and attractive. What are the economic, cultural, and discursive conditions for their rise in power? And here is my, my, my short explanation. The, uh, uh, the parade in Warsaw is organized by the association, March of Independence Association, uh, which is formed basically of two uh, nationalist radical organizations. ONR, National Radical Camp, and All Polish Youth. I focus on 
uh, this organization as this is the bigger, the stronger, the more visible, uh, and the more radical, I suppose. So the, here is the um, uh, uh, institutional background of this uh, uh, this uh, event in Warsaw. And here are some numbers. Uh, uh, as you can see, uh, eight years ago, the um, March of Independence covered 500 participants or less. Uh, this year, we had such a number of participants. And here you can uh, also uh, read the uh, mottos they uh, gather under. As you can call it, the generation comes, the army of patriots. This one is very interesting, I think. Uh, Poland's for the Poles, the Poles for Poland. Poland, the best of Europe, we want God. And the last one, God, Homer, Fatherland. And this was this year's, this year's motto. Uh, in a recent survey, uh, the researchers discovered that the acceptance of radical nationalist organizations such as Radical National Camp, this, this one with the green logo, is considerably higher among young people than elsewhere in the society. Almost 38% of young Poles uh, under 20 approve their political agenda. Two thirds, two thirds agree with the statement that the Polish nation suffered more than any other nation. Almost 60% believe that they can be proud of our history as the Poles acted in history nobler than the others. And here, here, here is some data about young Poles uh, and their political uh, 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 views. So, majority of them has no political views. 20% uh, declares them right-wingers, uh, center and liberal and left point uh, orientation is about 8%. The very interesting is the gender difference as uh, among those who have political uh, views, the uh, uh, majority of men choose right-wing politics, conservative politics, while women also, it's, it's very considerable number, 41%, but uh, the difference between men and women and men is, is considerable. So, in general, young people are uh, 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 right wingers, I think. So this is the social basis for radical groups. Uh, as for this noble historian, uh, Maria Jan, one of the most respected historians and cultural scholars in Poland, once noted: "Polish national culture is outstandingly masculine. The pivotal role is reserved to the social unions of brotherhood and friendship." These unions are emphasized throughout our history, from noblemen brothers of the 17th century, to romantic formations of male students in the 19th century, patriotic conspirators, Marshal Pilsudski's legions, the adorable Ulans, up to contemporary football hooligans. All these men, communities, contribute to the Polish national myth, yet the homosocial character of these unions is usually marked with a hint of homosexual fascination. The latter is denied by ostentatious attachment for national, national honor. Also, the cult of the Virgin Mary may to, may to, uh, has to exclude homosexuality and set up masculine relations as exclusively brotherly, brotherly ones. All the members of group are brothers, children of one symbolic mother, the Holy Mother, of course. Today, the pressure to exalt masculine unions seems to be rising everywhere. The recent example is the new design of Polish passports. It features the image of exclusively masculine independence heroes. The main page of the new design also includes the motto God, Honor, Fatherland, book Honor, which is now, uh, which was the historical motto of Polish army. But recently, it is associated with nationalists the Independence Day Parade in Warsaw and the very organization, organizational battle cry. Uh, the same, uh, as you see, the same, the same words you can see in the uh, banners of uh, uh, nationalists during the very 
parades, God, Honor, and Fatherland. Mm. Uh, scholars have observed and described the interesting phenomenon of remilitarization of Polish masculinity in popular culture, politics, and public institutions in recent years. <coughs> they generally agree that the militarized model of masculinity was dominant in Polish culture probably longer than in bourgeois society, societies of the West. Above mentioned, Maria Janion added that no other than military motivated model of masculinity could have occupied the hegemonic position in Polish historical imagination. Such military or paramilitary masculinities monopolized the hegemonic position throughout almost the whole 20th century. And now I'm going to skip uh, some paragraphs, but I want to show you one very interesting set of, uh, of uh, 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 pictures. Uh, uh, as the historians of art say, the picture of the Ulan, so the horseman, with the girl is the, very symbolic for, 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 the formation, for, for the formation of the nation. Uh, in prior Poland, uh, it was the first secular picture in Polish houses. Uh, it, uh, one, it is the uh, mark of, you know, re re reunited nation and uh, and uh, mark of uh, um, how to say uh, uh, of skipping the uh, uh, class divisions, as the girl is generally uh, uh, it's a peasant girl, and the and the uh, uh, horseman is uh, is a nobleman. Uh, but I want I I I. I that's only for, for you to to, to, to to do this information that military masculinity was all exalted during interwar period and uh, in post-war Poland, communist Poland, also this discourse of military masculinity proliferated. At the beginning of Polish transformation in 1994, uh, Maria Janion, I refer to her often in this essay, uh, one of the most influential Polish intellectuals noted that Traditional paradigms of Polish culture were drained and lost its legitimization. The intergenerational transfers were blocked. And here's the quotation. The youth doesn't care much and it's worth deeper consideration. Probably all of these discussions between the combatants and the civilians are false. Youth watch with disgust the heroes of bygone wars with all their medals, bands and flags. Young people unconsciously feel that they shouldn't care that it's not their business. Since then, since, since the 90s, things have been changing and the more traditional, the more willing to fight the vision of masculinity is often considered as more adequate. So this, the, this uh, fall of popularity uh, of military-related masculinity in the 90s uh, it's related to the fall of communism, when you know the consumer, consumer civilization, uh, capitalist uh, consumption uh, arrived. Uh, the model of uh, for, for, of male formation in army uh, has lost its charm simply. But since then, things have been changed, and more traditional, those more willing to fight vision of masculinity is often considered as more adequate. As I was trying to say, this traditional vision of masculinity gains legitimization through historical imagination, which is, in the Polish case, a vision of a warlike, ready-to-fight man. Attempts to remilitarize young men are an observable phenomenon nowadays. There are a few areas where we can see it. Probably the most interesting and the most noticeable, if not analyzed sufficiently, is the uh, popularity of so-called military classes in public high schools. The first 62 classes were organized in 1999 as an effect of the Minister of Defense program. But nowadays, no one has control over them and their number constantly rises. There were 700 classes, military classes in 2013 and, all, and uh, 1,340 uh, 1, in 2015. So it was Doubled. Some 50,000 students grade them every year. 
Such form of education is particularly popular in small and middle-sized cities in provincial Poland. Young people, mostly boys, believe that graduating such schools will allow them to start a professional career, become professional soldiers, policemen. Their motivation is, as surveys say, at least practical and partly economic. They expect to gain stable position and income. For many of them, such career model is considered as a sort of social advancement. But the truth is that neither the army nor the police favor military classes alumni who outnumber real needs of the army or the police. You might ask, why then schools decide to give baseless promises to young people? Such classes are extraordinarily popular there are three or four candidates for one place. Uh, and by organizing military classes, schools counteract the demographic decline and the loss of working positions for the teachers. Military classes fulfill youth expectances. Young people are fed up with the school cabarets and or human sciences. They want to stand in line. They miss discipline, claimed proudly Mr. Wojciech Groszyński, commandant of one of the better known military schools in Poland. The journalist Eva Turli, who specializes in education, alerts that military classes are often infiltrated by paramilitary nationalist, nationalist organizations. There are no specific data, but for example, in one of Russia's high schools, she investigated, the whole class enlisted to the, to the, to the shooter the paramilitary group. The shooter organization offers practical training in police or military actions but simultaneously filters ideological message that underground defense forces should be formed and its members should be ready to fight either external or internal enemy. Except pre-military pre training schools, except pre-military pre training schools, curricula abound in particular patriotic activities and the officially approved cult, cult of so-called accursed soldiers. I thought I tell about them later. For many students graduating military class without the possibility to start a career in army or police, is a shocking moment of truth. They are offered low-paid jobs in services, or they have to leave home to find a job elsewhere. For many of them, it is the moment when, the, when for the first time they can feel the emotion wittingly named aggrieved entitlement. They feel they are entitled to serve fatherland, but fatherland can do, it, can do without them easily and doesn't favor their school efforts and commitment. Another important factor of military remasculinization is the politics of memory, which is the milestone for the, for the identitarian ideology of Polish right-wingers. Since, uh, since 2005, the issue of politics of memory is in the core of public discussion in Poland. I'd like to focus only on one institution which shapes the contemporary politics of memory and has a considerable impact on how especially young people form their identities, shape their values, and understand history. The Museum of Warsaw Uprising was opened in 2004 by... Uh, mm, the museum was created thanks to the former president of Poland, Lech Kaczynski, and since the beginning it has been marked with, by his political bias. The uprising itself has numerous interpretations and still provokes emotional reactions. So commemorating it should be, as I believe, very cautious, nuanced, and balanced. Yet we are offered only one vision of the uprising celebrated in the museum, the heroic one. This vision celebrates in the first place those who fought in the uprising. The uprising is presented as an adventure, exciting event, attractive and desired to read the passage for patriotic youth. The suffering of, and here are some, some, some photos, murals, uh, uh, walls of elsewhere, uh, uh, film productions, TV series, uh, which present this surprising as, as, uh, as an adventure for, 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 uh, for young people and uh, uh, the industry of fashion uh, reacted for this, uh, for this uh, uh, politics of memory and produced uh, very fashionable in Poland t-shirts, roses, sweatshirts, hoodies, 
uh, and people wear it as a proof of their engagement in, in, in politics and, uh, and respect for the for, for, for the heroes. The uprising is presented. Oh, and last one. Oh, sorry. And even the blocks for children are 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 uh, uh, produced. Uh, you can construct the uh, barricade or you can create your own riser uh, uh, over there. Uh, so this is uh, uh, this ideology you can learn from from, from the kindergarten, simply. Uh, the present is presented as an adventure, exciting event, attractive and desired to write, read the passage for patriotic youth. The suffering of the civilians and the annihilation of the city is presented not as the other side of the coin as, and an effect of political miscalculations of Polish underground home army military leaders, but as a martyrdom and proof of Nazi barbarism exclusively. According to research, many of the visitors leave the museum with the false conviction that the uprising was a victory not the massacre and the annihilation of the capital and its civil inhabitants. The museum is one of the pivotal spaces for the production of the contemporary politics of memory. It initiated numerous popular films, TV series, music albums, performances, and gadgetization of memory. Remembering became fashionable and sexy. The form of remembrance is often considered as a marker of political sympathies and uh, one's identity, but it also reveals in other or in other words, codes, deeper effects. The heroic myth of the Warsaw Uprising has been to some degree hijacked by and cultivated in far right movements. Uh, and uh, this um, organization, National Radical Camp, this one green logo at the beginning, is a neo fascist organization. Is a neo fascist organization which considers itself an ideological descendant of the anti Semitic political movement which existed before World War II. ONR attracted publicity in, 2000, in the years 2005 2009 for unauthorized marches during the anniversary of the anti Jewish riots in uh, Michelinice town in uh, 1936. Uh, in 2005, the group had a couple of hundreds members. Since then, the organization has risen considerably and today is a leading member of the association The Merge of Independence, uh, which is a co-initiative co uh, of several different nationalist movements. But what is less known, ONR is also organizing marches and processions on the anniversary of the of Warsaw Uprising. It's a significant appropriation when the openly fascist organization claims to be the hereditary of those who fought fascism as the home army, which organized the uprising, represented opposite values than the fascists. It was recognized as the ally of the West. Probably the most interesting interpretation of this fact has been proposed by a historian and semiotics scholar, Marcin Napierkowski, who analyzed the uprising forms of commemoration and its political implications since 1945 onwards. He observed that under communism, the remembering of the uprising was forbidden, or at least considerably limited in scope. The event itself was presented as a futile. We were taught, I was taught, uh, that it was the Red Army progress, not the uprising, that incarnated the sense of history, the sense which couldn't have been contradicted. Within this conceptual frame, the uprising was purely irrational and ineffectual. Contrastively, the political and economic transformation uh, of the 90s with its neoliberal mm -hmm. mantra uh, and the uh, dominated uh, 90s and the first decade of the 21st century uh, uh, was also presented as the incarnation of the ubiquitous progress and, in and inevitable historical logic. Tina, there's no alternative you were taught. But in the second decade, the ubiquitous and the impact of the belief in the neoliberal economy and liberal democracy as the embodiment of the end of history considerably weakened. Uh, they have both lost part of their charm. Economic aims turned out to be difficult to reach. The democratic procedures appeared as alienating and ineffective. When the logic of the victorious march of progress fails, the triumphant march stops and gives way to a funeral procession. 
And, according to Marcin Nekulkowski, the uprising memory is, uh, is appropriated by those uh, who do not fit to the narratives of progress, or, less metaphorically, those whose economic, social, and cultural resources made them vulnerable to move downward social ladder. Such people turn to the past, not to the future. They search the sense of being as their own legitimization in the history, or rather imagined history, not in everyday reality, nor in an un unsure future. The admiration for the heroic commitment of the appraisers serves as, serves as a miraculous panaceum for the humanized global capitalism and intangible sense of bureaucratic institutions. Sounds familiar, I think. Lepurkowski didn't mention a brief entitled, entitled man of men, but we must add masculinity to his equation. The ONR, uh, this organization, uh, the ONR members do not celebrate the ideology of the home army, but what they exalt is a particular form of belligerent masculinity they believe the oppressors embodied, uh, the masculine agency that the liberal democracy together with neoliberal economy deny. Uh, uh, I skip some paragraphs, and I tell uh, now I focus on masculinity as as, as the division of masculinity this the groups uh, uh, share. Uh, oh yes, young Polish sociologist Bogdan Kuczykiewicz has analyzed the independence march organization discourse, official statements, websites, discussions <coughs> groups, Facebook profiles. Uh, she did it so to reveal the vision of masculinity they embody. She described the ideal type of Polish man uh, she extracted from these materials. And she, uh, she points these this, 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 uh, uh, traits. The man is courageous and ready to defend the fatherland and the women. Ready to control women fer women's fertility as it warranties the survival of the nation is homophobic and considers gayness or gayness visual, visual attributes as scornful and useless in the defense of the country. Such men are true men in contrast with their European counterparts who are presented in propaganda materials as emasculated by gender education and tolerantism, the symbols of the, and the reasons of the decline of the West in Polish nationalist size. Last but not least, such man is attached, attached to Catholicism and embodies the tradition of anti-rurale Christianitatis. Christianity is attacked from the Western secularism and the Eastern Islamism. To defend women and fatherland, men should work on their physical strength and sustain the cult of heroes, embodying such virtues as courage and sacrifice for the sake of the country and the nation. Popular t-shirts, internet graphics, mural graffitis invade public space with such slogans as Army of Patriots, Poland first to fight, with spelling mistake. Uh, death to the enemies of the, our fatherland. Particularly popular representation and identification unite contemporary radicals with the so-called accursed soldiers and the, variant mil of, and the variant of military masculinity they embodied. Young radicals identify themselves as the hereditaries of them. What can, we, what can we learn about Polish angry young men from this fact, from this myth of accursed soldiers? Uh, the cursed soldiers, in Polish, is a term applied to a variety of Polish anti-Soviet and anti-communist resistance movements formed in the later stages of World War II and its aftermath by some members of the Polish underground state. The clandestine organizations continued their armed struggle against the communist government of Poland well into the 50s. The guerrilla warfare included an array of military attacks launched against the communist regime, prisons and state security offices. No one denies the existence of the guerrillas, but they didn't call themselves actual soldiers, and their fight, as described by historians, is highly controversial. First of all, 
they fought against orders done by the high command in London, which decided to stop any military action after January 1945. <laughs> Secondly, a significant part of them were the groups of demo demoralized dogs of war, uh, without any sublime ideology or sense of a mission, as are meticulously documented by the historian Martin Zaremba. Thirdly, the accursed soldiers committed numerous attacks, massacres, and war crimes on civilians, Jews, Ukrainian, and Belarusian ma minorities. Uh, my grandma uh, often said that she was more afraid of these accursed soldiers than the Nazis or the Soviets uh, at the time. So they were simply uncontrollable. Uh, today, the accursed soldiers are officially celebrated on the 1st of March, it's the National Day of the Cursed Soldiers. <coughs> Their fight is popularized in school books and popular culture, for example, blockbuster movie Historia Royal, Polish blockbuster, of course. Besides this official policy of memory, they are the patrons of radical groups which cherish their radicalism and the spirit of independence from external powers and comments what is highlighted in the desperado character and the hopelessness of their fight against the overwhelming powers of treacherous West and Soviet East. And the, the, uh, it's also uh, very fashionable to wear uh, patriotic clothes with uh, in these emblems of accursed soldiers. Mm. The Alta Treaty of 1945 is often compared to the contemporary EU politics, which is seen as aiming at annihilation of uh, Poland and emasculation of Polish men, while irrational, deemed to fail, uncontrollable heroic fight is conceived as the essence of man's existence <coughs> and an example for the descendants. The discourse of radical right confronts with women's mobilization. Uh, probably you've heard about black protests in Poland. Uh, black protests against parliamentary attempt to implement the anti-abortion law. Black protests gathered hundreds of thousands of people, mostly women, to resist. The far-right groups stand against feminists, lesbians, and gays. Uh, that's the holy trinity of the enemies. Uh, far-right organizations actively supported the conservative part of Polish society, and the Polish a charge in their struggle to enforce this law. On this basis, the radical movements present themselves as the protectors of traditional values, Christendom, and the nation against the <coughs> morally corrupted EU with its gender politics and sex education, reproductory law, and the deliberation of women and respect for minorities. Uh, the nationalists' uh, websites, marches, uh, Facebook profiles abound in slogans like Here's Poland, not Brussels, here we do not suffer, support perversions. Uh, both liberal uh, women and LGBT people are considered as the internal enemy uh, or the artificial product of social engineering. The participants of the one of uh, important, uh, the participants of the March of the Independence in 2013 uh, set fire into artistic installation Rainbow by artist Rita Vujic on one of important Warsaw places. It's seen as a major symbolic victory of the radical movements. The homophobic fury of the ONR, of the, this organization I, I, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the homophobic fury of the ONR is so frenzied that sometimes it simply becomes funny and subverts the strength of homosexual bonding. In 2013, the ONR demonstrated against LGBT parade in Warsaw. One of the transparents became famous and is often satirized and loved at. The transparent uh, slogan is, we want men, not fags. Uh, uh, we want men, not fags, motto with horrible spelling mistake. The Polish is uh, it's horrible. Reveals <laughs> surpri surprisingly clear meaning and denounces miserable cultural capital of the banner holders. Uh, what is really desired are not only men, but also God. Each of the independence par parades has its leading slogan. In 2017, it was, we want God. This year's March's motto is God, Honor, Fatherland. 
the same as in the name, as in newly designed passport then. And as for Catholicism, that's the last point. Jasna Gura is a Catholic monastery with symbolic meaning in Poland. In the middle 17th century, the Poles successfully defended the cloister against Protestant Swedish siege, and it was believed that the Holy Mary intervened miraculously to save its people. The monastery kept functioning during the partition of Poland, during the German occupation, and under the communism. It's a symbol of the continuity and strength of the national idea. Each year during summer, hundreds of thousands of people from around the whole country pilgrim there to take part in religious celebrations and to listen to the bishop's statements on current issues which traditionally accompany these religious meetings. For the last five years, the ONR organization has been organizing its own pilgrimage to get the benediction from favorable bishops and priests. It is true, it is a true spectacle, a true party attack or torch parade where patriotic and religious traditions smoothly interfere with fascist iconography and requisites. You can see the photos of, from this party attack. Uh, uh, the Catholic creed is the important ideological glue for the for ONR masculinist ideology. O and R manifesto ac accentuates the theory when it defines the far-reaching political aim of creating, creating great Catholic Poland. We cannot predict the future. What I've described is visible. It's still, I believe, marginal phenomenon. Most boys and young men practice less nationalistic uh, and bellicose masculinity, not to mention women and girls whose attitude, according to a numerous surveys, is definitely less traditional, and let me express my feelings, uh, women won't accept the subordinated role that nationalist ideology ascribes to them. In another interesting survey, school psychologist Irena Urich interviewed last grade students of military classes. She concluded for research, uh, her research, that's a quotation, on the grounds of the analysis, we can ascertain that the main interest of the last grade students concentrated on alcoholic beverages, sexual experiences, socializing, and do-it-yourself activities. I believe this is an optimistic ending for this presentation. And uh, mm, as uh, the last uh, uh, element of my, uh, of my lecture, I got a short uh, movie prepared by uh, Governmental agency, uh, uh, which uh, is responsible for uh, popularization of patriotism uh, uh, in Poland and outside, and uh, this film is uh, very popular among, uh, among Polish uh, radical groups. I don't know how to how to start it. Could you help me, please? It takes two minutes or three to, to, to watch the whole movie. Okay, it's uh, it's in English, so you can you can you can listen uh, to the message. Uh, it's a bit weird. I'm sorry. Uh, the, the organization uh, slogan is "Respect us, respect the history." We have we have a sound here. Uh, for, the, the, Sure. Not sure. Okay, the, the first minutes are uh, silent, so then we will we'll see if, if uh, the actor appears and uh, we will see if you can hear me. We can move forward a little bit.
to get some. Great. So you couldn't get the, the whole idea, but the idea is that uh, he ironically apologizes every uh, nation, I mean Germans, Russians, as well as the Jews, and he finishes. Uh, 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 but why no one apologizes me for my, as you see, for 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 for, for being tortured, for being humiliated, and that stuff, and. Uh, mm, I think it is uh, it is it is very very popular video among uh, a Polish nationalist who uh, uh, demand respect. The, the, the most important thing they demand, they they need, uh, they desire is is being respected. I think. Uh, so that's all. Thank you very much. Sorry for my. English and Slavic accent. I believe I was at least partly understandable. Thank you yes. very much. Thank you.